Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our public forum on building resilient fisheries and coastal communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Mike Clare. I'm the Associate Director for Public Policy at Memorial University's Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development. Very pleased to be your host here this evening. Uh, delighted to uh, greet so many of you here with me in the Innovation Hall on the St. John's campus of Memorial University. Uh, it's a beautiful evening out there. It's the first nice evening of the spring, so your commitment to the fishery is duly noted. Everybody else in St. John's is out walking. I want to welcome those of you who are watching on the internet as well. Welcome. Uh, we welcome your comments and questions later on as well. Uh, this, in a way, is a sad day. Uh, this, uh, we learned today, the passing of John Furlong, the, the longtime host of the fisheries broadcast. Uh, he will be missed by very many in the fishing industry of this province. He has been a, played a leading role in getting discussions going on the fishery. Uh, and I want us to just take a moment to uh, reflect on his contribution and to, to think of his family at this uh, difficult time. So thank you, John Furlong. The last two decades have not been kind to the fishery of Newfoundland and Labrador, nor to those outport communities that depend on the fishery. In the, two dec in the decade fo following the announcement of the Cod Moratorium in 1992, about 80,000 people left this province to seek other employment. From being the most important industry in the province only two decades ago, the fishery has now become a sideshow to the much larger petroleum and mining industries. Today, the fishery is seen by many as a sunset industry, an industry where there are no prospects and where you wouldn't want your children to aspire to join. While this is somewhat understandable in light of the difficulties over the last two decades, this attitude amounts to throwing the baby out with the bathwater. As we'll see tonight, there is still much promise left in the fishery. We're the, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the organization of the session this evening. We're going to have three presentations. We're going to have a, about a half hour presentation by our main speaker, and that will be followed by two shorter presentations from our two panelists. Then we will ask the three of them to come to the front and to engage in a discussion session with you. And so for those of you who are in the audience here with me, I will circulate a wireless microphone. And for those of you who are watching on the internet, you will see an email address at the bottom of your screen and a Twitter handle. Please feel free to either send us an email or a tweet, and we will read your comment over the air uh, and intersperse that with the comments from the, the audience in here. And we will adjourn at 9.30 Newfoundland time or two hours from now. This video will be uploaded to the Harris Center's website as of tomorrow or very soon thereafter. So if you want to see this session again, you want to refer it to your friends, please visit the Harris Center's website. It's now my pleasure to introduce our main presenter this evening. Uh, I won't read her full biography, it'll take too long, but you do have a program that was handed out to you when you came in the room. And for those of you watching on the internet, you can download the program. Uh, so I'll just uh, read a little bit of it. Uh, Dr. Barbara Nice is a research professor in the Department of Sociology and a co-director of the Safety Net Center for Occupational Health and Safety Research here at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Her work has focused broadly on developing research partnerships to explore interactions between work, environment, health, and communities in rural and remote contexts. Dr. Nice is currently a member of the Ocean Science Project for the Council of Canadian Academies and a fellow, as well as the vice president of the Trudeau Foundation Society. She has received the President's Award for Outstanding Research at Memorial University and is a former board member of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Please help me in welcoming Barb Nees to the podium. Thanks very much, Michael. And thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I'm just going to make sure I know how to use this thing. Nope. Okay, so that works. Okay. Um, thanks also to the Harris Center uh, and uh, to Earl and Craig for agreeing to stand up here with me and uh, take on this, this challenging uh, issue. So tonight we're launching a policy paper entitled Moving Forward, Building Economically, Socially, and Ecologically Resilient Fisheries and Coastal Communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. This policy is the last major initiative of the Community University Research for Recovery Alliance. This was a seven, well, it was a five-year initiative that's now a seven-year initiative 
that used community-engaged research in West Coast, Newfoundland, fishery-dependent communities to help to identify ways our fisheries could realize their full ecological, social, economic, and cultural potential. The Cura was funded by SHRC and by Memorial University and the Research and Development Corporation and other agencies. We sought to make the sea, the creatures in it, and the tangible and intangible world of our fisheries visible to those people who've lost sight of the benefits derived from those fisheries in our coastal communities. These people are to be found among our young and working aged people, employers, politicians, and other citizens in this province as well as in the rest of Canada. Our research dealt with issues related to cod migrations, invasive species, deep water corals, species at risk, in particular the wolffish, and the herring and mackerel fisheries of the northern gulf. In fact, we just launched a report on that on our website today. We partnered in a detailed assessment of the effectiveness of lobster conservation initiatives and provided seed funding for the first major academic study of the northern shrimp industry, and that, uh, that uh, research is ongoing. We celebrated 40 years of marine research at the Bond Bay Marine Station with the people of the region and supported publication of a book documenting marine wildlife in the bay, a book that can, is both useful for teaching and for training, but also for all of the 100,000 or more visitors to the park. It helps them understand what's under the sea in Bond Bay. We helped develop a community sustainability plan for St. Paul's, explored the dwindling place of local seafood and community food security, and identified missed opportunities for promoting fisher synergies between fisheries and tourism. We examined youth employment options and their perceptions of the fishery and of their communities. We used research reports, drama, and art to make visible the social and environmental opportunities and challenges in our fisheries as well as local knowledge, as in Pam Hall's wonderful encyclopedia of local knowledge, which illustrates the booklet you have tonight. We created a new film festival called The People in the Sea, uh, and we, we had a photographic expedition on, uh, or exhibition on fish plants, uh, uh, creating an opportunity for us to interrogate their place, their dwindling place in our communities. And our last initiative is a film by Anne Troke, tentatively titled The 100 Nautical Mile Diet. It's designed to make people aware of all of the different kinds of seafood available here and the ways we could use much more local seafood in our diets. That film should be available in the next couple of months. So the policy paper. The policy paper we're launching tonight has been written be because of discussions at and following an international symposium that we hosted on the west coast of Newfoundland in October 2012. The rich array of presentations that were given from Canadians and from people in many parts of the world, and the lively discussions that followed involving researchers, policymakers, industry representatives, municipal leaders, and others, told us that the, one of the most important things we can do is to ensure that our future fisheries will be regionally and economically diverse, socially and ecologically resilient, and community-based. And it was a unique context, strikingly unique in a province that depends so heavily on its fisheries. It's way too unusual for all of those different groups to be sitting in the same room exploring this crucial issue. The policy paper was written for the, first I want to acknowledge my co-author, Rosemary Omer, who's not here but is online and listening. This paper wouldn't have happened without her. She left Newfoundland in the 1990s, but she's never really left, and she has over that time, invested and gathered and brought back to this province millions of dollars and a huge amount of support to do research here on our fishery. So I want to acknowledge Rosemary's contribution. In addition, we had a steering committee, a multi-stakeholder steering com committee that provided a great deal of advice and support, including Doug House, who's here tonight, Winston Fiender, who's here tonight, Paul Foley, who I hope is watching from Grenfell, Ian Fleming, thank you, you're here tonight, Carolyn Lavers, the mayor of port Bonnie McKay, a researcher from Rutgers who's been studying the Fogo Island fisheries for more than 40 years. Craig Pollitt, thank you, who's speaking tonight. Peter Sinclair, a former, former colleague 
and Keith Sullivan from the Fish Food and Allied Workers Union. And also Charles Mather, a colleague of mine, where we, and we've been working on the shrimp fishery together with him doing a lot of the work, uh, provided good advice. And the photographs and other images uh, were provided by Pam Hall. So what's our vision in this booklet? Building resilient fisheries and coastal communities for Newfoundland and Labrador's future is, we argue, one of the most important opportunities and challenges of our time. It is an opportunity because if we achieve it, we will be able to use our fisheries and coastal communities as an engine for economic diversification and future sustainability forever, unlike oil and gas. It is also a challenge because our coastal fisheries and communities are too often seen as a liability and dismissed as broken. We have to change our mindset from downsizing to revitalizing our fisheries, from disinvestment to investment in their future based on an appropriate valuing of these assets. That means we have to make a similar change of direction in our policies. In recent decades, our fisheries and coastal communities have weathered some severe storms, including the 1990s collapse of our ground fish stocks. Despite these storms, in many of our coastal communities, our fisheries continue to be the major source of employment and wealth generation, a crucial contributor to the overall rural economies, to our identity, and to our cultural heritage. Their capacity to respond to these stresses without fundamentally changing their basic owner-operator, community-based structure, and their regional and sectoral diversity is evidence of their resilience. There is important resilience in our fisheries and coastal communities. That resilience is now in jeopardy. First, it's vulnerable to unfounded claims that our fisheries are broken, and the best way to fix them is by turning fisheries quotas and licenses into commodities that can be bought and then sold to the highest bidder. Second, it is vulnerable to lobbies that are calling for vertical integration, since that would mean the abandonment of our long-standing commitment to maintaining our fisheries as a foundation for regional economic development in many communities and regions. Our fisheries are not broken. Accepting these unfounded claims would mean jettisoning policies that have kept access to many, but no, though not all, of our fish resources widely dispersed around our coasts and allocated to owner-operators. It would undermine the access to the resources and incomes of those who actually do the fishing and do the processing. Moreover, it would produce a wave of further plant closures, erect new barriers for the entry of young people into fisheries, and may well not deliver the conservation benefits that are claimed for it. Our research, like that of many other researchers globally, showed us there is no panacea that will automatically ensure our future fisheries are sustainable, profitable, and equitable, and we think all three are important. No magic wand can be waved to ensure that they contribute substantially to regional economic development and community food security into the future. It will take hard work, a collective drive, to balance all of these diverse objectives as we revitalize our fisheries and coastal communities, and the place to begin that drive is with appropriate policy. So we put together a policy paper. That's not what you have. What you have is a booklet that has a very short summary and our recommendations. And behind that is a 100-page, substantially researched policy paper. Uh, and that background document is available online at the Cura website. In that document, we have six chapters. The first chapter looks at contemporary fisheries and coastal communities. The second takes on this question, are our fisheries broken? The third focuses on the strengths of our fisheries and coastal communities. The fourth talks about the real vulnerabilities that we think exist. Five is the recommendations which you have in the booklet that we've given you. And for those of you who are online, that booklet is also available on our website. Uh, and then five basically is a conclusion, what's at stake and why. So what are the real strengths in our communities and fisheries? Over the last decades, and despite huge challenges, we've sustained diverse fisheries that balance vertically integrated corporate enterprises in some areas with strong inshore and nearshore owner-operated enterprises and onshore community-based processing in other places. 
Our owner-operator fleet is the economic engine of our coastal communities and is Atlantic Canada's largest sectoral employer. I just noticed that Telegram had a special issue on, called Innovation on Small Businesses and I didn't see one fishing enterprise in it. The coexistence of different kinds of harvesting and processing enterprises has been a key strength of our fisheries, balancing efficiency with equity, responding to diverse regional ecologies and histories, and dealing with ecological and market volatility. And this is, just gives you a sense of the kind of ecological and fishery diversity that I'm talking about. When we listen to the government talk about our fisheries or we hear, listen to discussions often on the broadcast, we hear about four species. Shrimp, crab, cod, lobster, maybe we will hear about that. But this is just, these are the landings from 1998 to 2011 in 3 p.m., a small part of our fishery off the southwest coast. More than 50 species. And in fact, no shrimp, no crab, a very, very different fishery than we would find if we did the same regional breakdown of species landed in another part uh, of our province. And I want you to keep that diversity in mind as we move forward. Other real strengths. Although not perfect, the structure of our fishery has hel helped to develop fisheries that are by and large competitive and that generate substantial wealth while also anchoring a good share of it in fishing households and fisheries dependent communities and regions. We have the best trained fish harvesters in the country. We have huge investments in fisheries and coastal infrastructure. We possess strong local and professional knowledge of fisheries including the results and insights of a major national and provincial investment in scientific, and by that I mean natural and social sciences and humanities and engineering, all different kinds of knowledge, huge expertise and capacity here. The federal government, despite its challenges, has played a vital role in terms of stewarding Canada's oceans, and it's a signatory to key international agreements and has in the past created some strong policies that supported our fisheries. We have strengths, too, in our provincial level governance. We have institutions like the Professional Fish Harvester Certification Board and the newly formed Fish Harvesting Safety Association. The 2011 Coastal and Ocean Management Strategy and Policy Framework is significant, and the province has done important reviews of processing and harvesting and marketing options. The province's minimum processing requirements have helped ensure much of our seafood is landed and processed to some degree, in the province, and its quality assurance program improve the market returns for snow crab. We produce high quality seafood that meets international quality and traceability standards. Our aquaculture industry is both a strength and a vulnerability, but one strong area is mussel production, recently certified as organic. We have some excellent examples of innovative policies that have supported important initiatives that have contributed in substantial ways to the resilience of fisheries and coastal communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. And just three examples from the shrimp fishery work that we've been doing. The Labrador Fishermen's Union Shrimp Company, without which I do not think we would still have a fishery on, La on the Labrador coast. Sabri, the St. Anthony Basin Resources Initiative and the Fogo Island Co-op. Just three examples. Other strengths include the Fish Food and Allied Workers Union. It plays a key role in ensuring a substantial amount of the wealth that's generated from our fisheries is used to support people living and working in coastal communities. It also plays a key role in terms of linking all of those fish harvesters and plant workers who are widely dispersed about across this province into a complex governance system dealing with often very remote bureaucrats and scientists. We have large, internationally competitive, vertically integrated companies that are well linked to international markets, some of them doing very well. We have some small processors, not enough, serving regional and niche markets. And we have a growing global demand for seafood and an anticipated growth in key resources looking forward to 2050. The projections are quite astounding in terms of what they expect to happen to global seafood markets, which basically those are all of those assets that belong to us that are off of our coast. They are going to increase in value 
in part and unfortunately because food production in many parts of the world is going to decline due to the effects of climate change. So given these strengths, the real criticism that should be leveled at our fisheries and coastal communities instead of the claim that they're broken uh, is basically that they are undervalued. We undervalue both the living marine and coastal natural resources of our fisheries and the capacity for effective governance in those communities. We undervalue the stewardship that is carried out on our behalf by the people living in those communities. We undervalue their innovative capacity and the innovation that they've done. And we undervalue the wealth generation that they uh, are responsible for. We also undervalue the culture and legacy of our coastal communities and their relationship to the fisheries in the ocean. Our fisheries and coastal communities are vulnerable to policy failure because they are seriously undervalued by all levels of government and I would argue by all of us. They're also vulnerable in other ways. Our, the vulnerability of our communities and fisheries will deepen if we do not shift our emphasis, and this is a main argument in this paper, from downsizing, reducing the number of people in the industry and the number of plants and the number of enterprises towards revitalizing our fisheries and coastal communities. These are and will continue to be, if we value them, the backbone of the nature and essence of Newfoundland and Labrador. Another vulnerability I've already mentioned is the claims by industry leaders that fisheries are broken and require fundamental change, including the widespread introduction of individual transferable quotas and the removal of barriers to vertical integration. And in chapter two of the policy paper, we look closely at the record of ITQs and vertical integration in other parts of the world. And basically, the picture is not pretty. They are, we cannot, based on that review of the research, expect ITQs and vertical integration to deliver the things that the corporate leaders have been claiming they will deliver. What are some of our other vulnerabilities? There are vulnerabilities in our marine and coastal knowledge and governance. We do not understand enough about many marine species and ecosystems that support them to, in order to have the base to adequately assess how they are now and how they will be in the future, particularly under climate change. We're already seeing the effects of climate change. We're already seeing it play itself out in stock assessments. Well, you know, the water temperature is changing. There may be more of those. And where, when we have scientific uncertainties, then those uncertainties about what's going on with, in climate change can really have an impact in terms of our capacity to make appropriate judgments. There has been inaction or limited action on ecosystem-based management, marine protected areas, biodiversity protection, and habitat protection. We did a study on deep sea corals in the Cura. We identified using fishermen's ecological knowledge and science, a possible coral bank off, off the west coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. To my knowledge, there has been no follow-up on the identification of that feature under the water or any movement to protect it. There's limited provincial engagement in coastal and resource management, and sadly, the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture is seriously underfunded and getting worse. It has lost 40% of its budget in two years. The diversity of expertise within DFA and DFO is too limited, in our view, to deal with the complex challenges and opportunities that come with developing policy to enhance the resilience of fisheries and coastal communities. There are no, me in any meaningful sense, social scientists inside the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And again, the range of expertise in these departments is way too narrow. The industry also has vulnerabilities. Despite its strengths, it continues to be focused on the mass production of a relatively narrow range of commodities that are derived from a few species and are destined for export to a relatively small number of countries and buyers. We could be, but we are not, significant players in the new niche markets that are opening up. We have not taken full advantage of possible geographical and special fishery product branding and marketing featuring unique product from the area. And there are regulatory and other barriers to enhancing synergies and thus the potential for employment, research and development 
and wealth generation uh, within fisheries and between fisheries and other sectors, particularly tourism. Our communities are also facing very severe vulnerabilities. They're faced with population decline, the loss of fisheries from their economic base, a process that could accelerate. They're also threatened by the weakening of minimum processing requirements, which could accelerate that decline. There are issues with the long-term viability and intergenerational transfer of our owner-operator fisheries and many of our onshore plants. It's not clear who's going to take over these enterprises, and the labor forces and the owners are aging. And these are the most significant means we possess to anchor fisheries employment and wealth in the province. And then we have, as I've already indicated, both climate change and ocean acidification. And we must not forget about ocean acidification. We also have the erosion of the place of seafood and community food security in the province. We're eating McDonald's, we're eating Tim Hortons, we're eating Robins. Are we really eating seafood? And in particular, the absence of regional government or regional mechanisms to support regional economic development and promote synergies across sectors. And the most crucial, the most recent uh, development that happened while we were working on the Cura was the elimination of the regional economic development boards. They may not have been perfect, but they were finally, after many years, getting actively involved in fisheries issues and bringing together a broad range of stakeholders to start looking at these issues and to have the, 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 the carpet pulled out from under them and from under those communities, I think, uh, was devastating to those communities. So our vulnerabilities will deepen, we argue, unless we shift our emphasis from downsizing to revitalizing our fisheries and coastal communities, which are, and will continue to be if valued, the background, backbone of the province. To do that, we need a policy framework that can act as a roadmap to this end. And our recommendations are an attempt to set us on that road. They're not going to, they're not a full roadmap, but they're a, an attempt to get us started. So what kinds of recommendations have we got? We have an overarching recommendation that speaks to the point that I just made. Basically, the federal and provincial governments, the FFAW and industry, should continue to shift their emphasis. And again, it's a shift of emphasis. The industry has been downsizing. It will continue to downsize. The question is whether we've reached some kind of critical tipping point where it could well, in some regions, go too far too fast. By developing and implementing a policy framework with revitalization as its core objective. What do we mean? We're saying revitalization. What does that word mean? Let's just sit with that word for a minute. To give new life or vigor to something. That's what we're talking about recharge, regenerate, rejuvenate, renew. Investment, creative thinking, innovation, support is what we're talking about. We're talking about a future that is not just a smaller version of what we have today. Conservation and management, we have recommendations on that. The federal government should provide the investment needed as opposed to disinfect investing to ensure that it is able to live up to its commitments in international agreements. And the province should increase its capacity to participate as a major stakeholder in fisheries science and management, particularly as these affect coastal communities. We cannot afford to not be more actively engaged as a province. We recommend also from the point of conservation the establishment of a network of coastal community observatories throughout the province, speaking to the ecological and economic diversity that I talked about at the beginning. It's not adequate to have a policy for fisheries that is a blanket policy for the province, to have thinking for, for fisheries and research for fisheries that is a blanket way of thinking for the province. These are very diverse, and we need opportunities and regionally-based research to look at what can we do in the Port of Basque region? What can we do on the West Coast? What could be done on the Southern Shore? Because it won't be the same opportunity in these different places. And the mandate of these observatories should be community-engaged, multidisciplinary, problem-solving research. 
with training and value-added activities on top of that. And this is an example, this was the vision of the Cura. This is what we tried to achieve with the Cura over seven years using the Bon Bay Marine Station. And as we wrapped it up, we wrote a report with a future vision for how this could be sustained at the station. And it isn't, and it doesn't have to be hugely expensive. It is a huge opportunity. We're underutilizing our university resources and we're underutilizing the resources like the station that are in coastal communities. Recommendation four and others. The new policy framework should include a carefully developed strategy for supporting the viability of small and medium scale owner operator enterprises. Retention and enforcement of the policies that protect them the, including the fleet separation policy and the policy around controlling agreements. Unfortunately, at the moment, the federal government is supporting those. And then balanced and coherent policies arrived at through transparent processes. Um, we also need those, and on those grounds, we reject the last in, first out policy in the shrimp fisheries, which is neither balanced nor was it arrived at in a transparent way. We are weakening our commitment to minimum processing. You can see it if you read provincial government documents. You see it over, over time, there's less and less reference to minimum processing requirements. There are arguments why certain types of fish, certain kinds of things should be leaving the province without a lot of processing. And of course, lots of things already do. But the point is, if we are going to go in that direction, if we accept that these requirements have played a key role in terms of anchoring fisheries wealth and employment in coastal communities and creating jobs particularly for women in these communities, then we should have a systematic review and investigation into the history of those requirements and a careful and thorough review of what's the alternative. If we're not gonna have minimum processing requirements, what are we going to have in this province to make sure that we are doing the most we can to anchor wealth and employment in rural communities? We need an integrated rural development approach here. It, our strategy has to be based on the recognition that fisheries resilience and the resilience of coastal communities are interdependent. And this is another thing, when you read the government documents, Communities are referenced less and less. Or if they're referenced, they appear kind of sporadically, as though the people who threw community in didn't know why they threw it in. We're saying they're in there because of the strong interdependence that exists and must exist between communities and fisheries. We need to bring together, in order to do that, the representatives of coastal municipalities and many other groups. They need to be brought into fisheries discussions. Really, since, since the moratorium, there's been the fishing industry and there's been municipalities and there were some regional economic bodies. The regional economic bodies weren't supposed to deal with fisheries. The industry has largely operated separately from communities. And municipalities have often, have people, leaders in those communities often know very little about the fishery and what's going on in it, even though it is fundamental to their economic base. We need to end that. We need to create forums where people can come together for those discussions, and we also need to bring in other groups. And the Cura did that. I showed you. You know, we have social scientists, natural scientists, artists, you know, municipal leaders, community development organizations. Get them in the room and talking, and get young people in the room and talking about our fisheries. And this is an example of what happens when you bring an artist into contact with the fisheries. This spectacular page that captures the local knowledge of a fisherman on the northern peninsula. A type of knowledge that is disappearing, but that is, uh, has been and was and continues to be a very, very important part of our heritage. She is able to make visible, both to the people in those communities and to anybody else, the kind of knowledge that we're in danger of losing. So we need regional government, we think. We need a mechanism ideally some form of regional government, to develop regionally appropriate initiatives, promote synergies between sectors. Individual businesses aren't going to do that for the most part. They're in competition with each other. We need somebody whose job it is to create synergies. 
between sectors, somebody whose job it is to make sure that we're doing integrated coastal zone management. We have a fiction that we're doing it. I don't see any meaningful evidence that we are. And they, they can also take care of infrastructure. Our, our, you know, our wharves, the infrastructure that we have that is the bridge between the land and the sea, between us and the sea, are being maintained by harbor authorities. They're supported by harbor authorities without often enough support. You know, so if we had a regional government, we could come up with strategies and more effective means for promoting and saving that infrastructure. We need to ensure that this regional mechanism is adequately resourced, locally elected, as opposed to appointed, which is our standard way of dealing with people in rural areas, and not subject to the changing political agendas of federal and provincial governments, so that the government tomorrow can say, I'm sorry, we don't feel like funding you, I'm sorry, you know, move on. Rural communities have very, very limited human capital resources. They work with very, very limited financial resources. And when you go in and pull out something as crucial, you know, as, you know, three or four or five well-trained people, a small amount of resources, the resources they needed to have the capacity to leverage the resources urban people take for granted, you, it's devastating for those communities. We have to deal with this problem too, and this is a quote from a report by municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador that is dealing with the question of regional government. It's poignant. Having never been independent or autonomous, municipalities survive through stubborn perseverance and an increased tolerance of accepting and doing less. Municipalities are provided with enough support to get by, but not nearly enough to be sustainable and thrive. And we really saw this in the community of St. Paul's. We were working with that community. They have tremendous opportunities in that community. A huge amount could be done, and the only municipal person they had was the clerk, who was overworked, underpaid, and constantly wondering when she was going to move to Alberta to be with her children. We need young people in order to revitalize our fisheries. We need them because we need a way to support the intergenerational transfer of harvesting and processing enterprises and their assets in a way that ensures that these are retained wherever possible by people living and working in the regions adjacent to the resources on which they rely. Basically, we've told our young people there is no future in fisheries. We haven't given that opportunity to enough of our young people. And I think, you know, we've sold them a line. They went off to university. They end up often in service sector jobs. Youth unemployment is high. They end up with big student loans, and then they have to go to Alberta. There are alternatives, I think. It doesn't hurt to go away. It's good to come back. But we, you know, in a sense, there are more opportunities in this industry than they've been led to believe. But you don't just become a fisherman overnight, and you don't learn how to be a fisherman in the Marine Institute. You learn how to fish by being on a boat. And if we don't take our young people out on the sea, they're not going to learn how to fish. And if they are not comfortable in, with the sea, and I challenge you, how many young people in this province today are comfortable on the ocean? How many? I would say very few. And I think that is a tragic loss. Not simply to fisheries, because those skills, in fact, are transferable over many things, everything from recreation to work in multiple other sectors. Fisheries can be a training ground for many different things. So there are huge opportunities here, and fish harvesters did the job of training people to be comfortable on the sea. And I think you know, we need to recognize that if they don't do that, that is going to be a huge loss to this province. We need to get fisheries into the school. We need to get it into the school curricula. We need to get guidance counselors suggesting to young people that maybe fisheries would be a reasonable living. And that could include, again, seafood processing, not just fishing. Seafood processing workers in this province are skilled workers. Many of them are very well trained, and they have dedicated their lives to this industry, often at great personal cost to themselves. And we need processing workers. We need those skilled processing workers. Many of us do not know how to fillet a fish. Most of us, I would say, do not know how to deal with seafood appropriately. And we also need to draw on the skills of young people. They know things that older generations 
people don't know. They're comfortable with social media. Social media could be a crucial tool in terms of diversifying and revitalizing our fisheries. More young people, more training in science, more training in a whole range of things, writing skills, web skills, and so on, all of those could produce a more revitalized fishery. So we need to encourage young people's interest in and entry into fisheries. And we won't do that if we keep saying it's broken. We won't. And we won't do that if basically the only way you can access fishery resources is through a few vertically integrated companies. They need to get on and off the water training, and they, they'll need that to survive and to thrive indeed in what is a very complex and very challenging industry. We need to focus on the full basket of more than 50 different species, not 450, that are currently landed in different regions and species we're not yet landing. There are all kinds of market opportunities that are going to open up in terms of pharmaceuticals and, and cosmetics and nutraceuticals and so on. We need a strategy to take our fisheries and broaden them, to get into seaweed, to get into a, a, a richer array of products. We need to develop new and existing local, national, and international specialized market niches for seafood products. We've been focusing on eco-labeling through the Marine Stewardship Council. That's one option, but there are other options. And we need to be looking at things like fair trade marketing options, where basically what you're selling is not simply ecological sustainability, but social justice. We have the basis for being able to market our seafood products based on the structure of our industry using a fair trade label if we go in that direction. And we need more opportunities for hybrid enterprises, fishery tourism, stewardship fisheries tourism. There's a $300 billion industry in stewardship, marketing stewardship. We do stewardship. We do a lot of it. We could do a lot more. And if we marketed the work we were doing, both directly through our seafood and indirectly in terms of tourism and education and so on and so forth, we could generate much more wealth. Again, just a reminder of the species diversity that we're looking at there. And, and you know, this, this, the species that was the most important economically yesterday may well not be the species that's the most e important economically tomorrow. And we have to remember that, and that's one of the reasons why we need to be taking care of all of our species and paying attention to biodiversity. Provincial seafood security. We have to develop strategies to enhance the contribution of the industry to provincial food security, thereby creating new markets and improving our health. We say the provincial government should aim to triple per capita seafood consumption by 2020. I had an economist read this report, and he's from BC, and he grew up in Africa, and he said, oh my god, can the stock stand it? And I thought, yes, in this province, with this population, our fish stocks could certainly handle a tripling of seafood consumption by 2020. We need more retail seafood establishments in many places, including my pet peeve, inside the Marine Atlantic Terminal in Port of Basque, so that people who are trapped inside the terminal and forced to eat frozen seafood that comes from God knows where could actually go into that seafood market, perhaps run by a fisherman's co-op, and buy the seafood that they want to take with them wherever they go. We need community-supported fisheries. We could have one in St. John's. It could be Petty Harbor fishermen. They could be out in Conception Bay. Basically, we as consumers commit to those fishermen to pay them X amount of money, and we take the fish that they deliver to us every week. We have no community-supported fisheries in this province. They exist in Nova Scotia. They exist in Maine. They've been a key way for some small-scale fishermen have revitalized uh, their fisheries and increase their incomes with a relatively small share of their catch. Plus the benefit that you're building a whole group of people who are suddenly very interested in fisheries and what's happening in the industry and supportive of the people who work in it. In conclusion, we need to celebrate our fisheries, past and present and the people who work in them. We need more opportunities for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to learn about our fisheries 
to enjoy the fruits of our work, and I can't wait to see Anne Trope's film. She showed us some footage the other day of a seal, um, a seal hunter basically laying out in front of her all of the different parts of the seal that you could eat, uh, and then the, the cooking of these by Todd Perrin, and it was the most, you could tell, it was the most delicious food many of these people had eaten. So we need to enjoy the fruits of our work, quite literally, and the generations of investment that we have made as a province and as a people in our fisheries and coastal communities. Over centuries, we've built some, but not all, of the knowledge, experience, and institutions we need to govern our fisheries. But without the kind of focused work and investment that we advocate in this document, our future and that of our children, we think, will be much bleaker and less rich with opportunity, beauty, and diversity than it could be. So help us on our way. And, and we, we've done a little bit of work for you. Uh, Pam, Paul, and myself, and Rosemary Ulmer got together and imagined some things that we might be adding to our fisheries by 2020. So we have a map showing uh, more, you know, uh, up at the top we couldn't fit it on the ferry, so it's more fresh seafood served on board our ferries. Community radio stations and local fisheries ocean programming. Local seafood in schools, God forbid. When was the last time you saw seafood in schools? Uh, and hospital cafeterias. After all, we, we don't market the fact that our fish grow, our seafood grows in cold water, and that means that nutritionally it's actually superior to many other kinds of seafood. And we've done that research here at Memorial. The work is done. We could be marketing it uh, on that basis. So we've got uh, community-supported fisheries. We've got uh, coastal observatories on this map. It's at the back page of your booklet if you want to look at it. Uh, we've got uh, an econ you know, fisheries economies where basically instead of a fish plant that's walled up and nobody can get access to it, you have a fish plant uh, that is also a museum, that's a living, working museum that produces a variety of products, uh, you know, value-added products, different types of pickled herring, smoked fish, one could imagine salted fish, a whole range of things. Uh, and where we can, you can go into that Economuse, just like we have for Dark Tickle, and learn about the industry and buy food. And that could be the basis for the development of products we could then start marketing nationally and internationally. So anyway, I'll leave you with that. Uh, and you know, if you're interested, send us more ideas. And you know, maybe we, I think we might need a new map um, because we're running out of space. But we think there's lots that could be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barb, for your excellent presentation on a wonderful report. I don't think there's any aspect of the fishery that you don't address in your report. And I know there's many more recommendations in the report, so I urge everybody to, uh, to read it and to help move something forward. So Barb and her team have started something, and if those of us who are interested in revitalizing the fishery, uh, there's work for us to evangelize this work. Uh, I now want to bring uh, two presenters, uh, one after the other. I'll introduce them both, both at the same time in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, and again, as before, there's more information about them uh, in the program, but I think they almost need no introduction, but having said that, I'll give one anyway. Earl McCurdy has been president of the Fish, Food, and Allied Workers, the fisheries-based sector of the Canadian Auto Workers Union, one of the founda founding unions of Unifor in Newfoundland, Labrador for the past 20 years. He took over as president of the FFAW less than a year after the federal government closed down the cod fishery on the East Coast, throwing FFAW members out of work in what has been described as the biggest layoff in Canadian history, and requiring a dramatic rethinking of the fishery, the union, and rural Newfoundland and Labrador. He will be followed to the podium by Craig Pollitt. Craig is the CEO of Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, the collective organization representing provincial municipalities in the province. He plays a leadership role in lobbying and advocacy, as well as policy research and development. Prior to his work with municipalities in Newfoundland and Labrador, Craig spent more than 10 years working in economic development and policy analysis, first with the Atlantic Entrepreneurial Institute at Memorial University, and then moving to the provincial government as a senior policy analyst. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists and please welcome Earl to the podium.
Well, thanks, uh, Mike, and good evening, everyone. Um, don't you hate it when you're, got out, you're going out to make a presentation and you squeeze in some time to put some notes together and then you go and leave them on your desk when you leave in a hurry because <laughs> you, you, you've just been working on shrimp negotiations all day and you're trying to gag down a bit of supper before your presentation. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can with it, I guess. Uh, it's certainly, I always wanted to be kind of Barb's warm-up act, but they kind of reversed the role, so I'll come in after. But it is a, I certainly appreciate not just the work she did on this particular paper, but Barb's work on the fishery generally and really making the university relevant to the, uh, the broader community. I think it's been very important work she's done, notably in, in health and safety uh, uh, area, but also in other areas of, of fisheries policy and, uh, and management. The, there's one, because you could, you could, I could do in the bit of time I got could, to pick 20 topics from this paper and, and easily use up that time on just those topics. But I thought, uh, and I, you, to try and touch on all of them or even several, you, you could hardly do justice to it. So I picked out one sentence, and I think that as a at least a starting point, and I'll uh, read it out. Uh, the report says thus, and she's quoting actually from um, another researcher uh, named Olson. Uh, thus, the question of whether to introduce or further privatize fishery resources is ultimately not simply an issue of economic efficiency, but a question of what values to promote and what the future of the fishery and its fishing community should look like and who should design, and who should decide. Because really, a set of fisheries management policies is a set of values. That's what it is. So if someone says, well, the most important thing is economic efficiency, well, that's a, that's a value judgment in itself. But in, 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 uh, in considering that, let me ask this one. If we could design, and we take the shrimp fishery just because that's in currently uh, in, in, in hot, uh, in hot, under hot debate. If somebody could come up with a way to get the best return from that fishery by having the entire uh, allocation or, or available amount of fish, shrimp caught with one boat that was operated by one person, would we do it? Is that, you know, if you say, well, if economic efficiency is your, if that's what, do, what drives decision making, well, why wouldn't you? Except then you'd say, well, what is the benefit to our society of that? Other than if you happen to be that one individual, you probably <laughs> might do okay. But other than for the other 519,999 others of us, the, or whatever the number is, what, what benefit is there? So it really, all, all these things are value judgments. And they should be based one would think, on some kind of set of principles. In other words, you don't just sort of say, well, here's our policy. So witness the conversation about the so-called LIFO, last in, first out policy, which is described by some as if it were, at the very least, uh, a, a, a kind of a cornerstone of the Magna Carta or something, <laughs> um, if not from, uh, you know, brought down in, on tablets from the mouth. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I would challenge not only everybody here, but the minister who wrote such a disingenuous, or someone she didn't write it at all, somebody on, put her name on a, on a very disingenuous letter that puts her in a bad spot in terms of, of the, uh, the debate that will follow. Um, the, I would challenge them, show me in the, in the DFO document where LIFO is defined. Just show me the piece of paper that says here LIFO means as follows, because I've been able to find it. Show me in the integrated shrimp management plan where LIFO is defined. Now the words are there, but they could be, there's 101 different ways you could say we'll apply a policy to LIFO. But really the value judgment that, is com that we're coming down to in the shrimp issue very quickly, uh, because there's a very significant change taking place in the ocean, which has, has sweeping consequences, they're different, but probably just as sweeping for our province, as the change that took place in the, that, that gave rise to the uh, Northern Cod Moratorium. Uh, there was 30 years of, of water cooling in the years leading up to the moratorium. 30 consecutive years, essentially, of the temperature going down. And since 1995, we've had what's clear, we're pushing 20 years of the temperature going up, basically. Well, that has major consequences. And so we are going to have, not only we have less shrimp this year than we had last year, if Jimmy the Greek was taking odds, Jimmy would say, you're going to have less shrimp next year than you got this year. 
In fact, in the nature of, of, of how biomass estimates are done using multiple years uh, surveys, it's almost a certainty that the next year's biomass estimate will lower and we have to do it less. So the choice is, it's not just some esoteric uh, uh, alleged policy with, a, with, a, with a, a name that lends itself to an acronym. The choice is, will offshore license holders, many of whom have at least some, if not a majority of their basis in countries other than Canada, and certainly other than Newfoundland and Labrador, will they take priority or will Fogo Island survive? This was down to Fogo Island. We continue as we're doing it and go on the next two years with no change in how that LIFO policy is, is run. Fogo is in as dire a, a, a threat of, of, uh, of being finished every bit as much as it was in 1969 when the Mon Extension people went in and started the Fogo project, or 68, whenever it was. Not only Fogo, St. Anthony, Charlottetown, various other twilling gates, those communities are under real threat. So how we manage, or how, you know, the, we're not just talking about some, it's not just some, you know, who, you know, a couple dollars more this way or that way. We're talking about some, a very significant uh, policy decision. Um, I was certainly pleased to read in the paper that our fishery is not broken because the only thing that gets on my nerves more than people telling me, well, you know, the future of the fishery is, the fishery is finished or it's only a minor industry and stuff like that is when people whose policy decisions really make that a threat are the ones who then say, well, sure, the industry you got is no good. Well, maybe if you hadn't made such stunt, stunt policy decisions, we wouldn't be in the, in the fix we're in. But the fact of the matter is, take the shrimp alone. Since that, uh, Fred Mifflin, un, unheralded Fred Mifflin, uh, who's probably best remembered for getting caught by Cameron when he locked himself out of the room and couldn't make a quick exit, he made big changes to help the fishery in this province, and I'll give him credit for that. The, in, he went against the absolute determined opposition of his own department in opening the door to the, in, the cook and peel shrimp fishery in this province. Since then, roughly, the value to the province of our shrimp landings from the inshore sector, round numbers, $2 billion. Now, think about that figure. That's the figure when Premier Williams came down the escalator at the airport and said, we got it. We got it. What we got was a $2 billion improvement in our deal on the offshore. And in that 15-year period or so, since that was, and that's roughly the amount of money that the shrimp fishery has put into Fogo and Twillingate and, and Charlottetown and St. Anthony and Port of Soie and Anchor Point and community upon community I could name off uh, in our province. Uh, so we have to, uh, you know, we're in it together. Uh, Craig's group, the, the, the municipalities are really, and I was really pleased to see uh, the mayor of Grand Falls and the mayor of Twillingate, uh, to name a couple. The mayor of Port of Soie just a few weeks ago was at a podium with her on the Northern Peninsula, to see them stand up and, and publicly recognize and, and, and speak very eloquently to how dependent their community is on the new dollars that come over the side of a fishing vessel, because that's what generates the economic activity in those little towns. And think of all the, over the years, some are a harebrained scheme, some were, I think they're all uh, various kinds of projects aimed at saying how can we create or, or, or generate, trigger economic activity in those little communities. And most have been unsuccessful for the simple reason that they weren't really like natural of the situation and the, the one industry that can kick start that economy and that we should be proud of is our fishery. So it is refreshing to read a report that, uh, that recognizes that. I'll just uh, touch uh, uh, real briefly on the, um, the, uh, the issue, the privatization issue, because I get sick of reading that uh, you know, that, well, if you really want the key to stewardship of our fish resources is to privatize it so then people own it and then therefore they're going to take better care of it. Um, well, as Joe Friday used to say on Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am, let, let's, let's have a look at the, what, what, let's, tr let's look at historical fact in this regard. In the 1990s, in an era in this province of despair and desolation, and soul searching, 14 ground fish stocks, as I think that was number, 14 or 15 ground fish, fish stocks uh, were placed under moratorium in this province, representing that 
Cod. We had all those big plants that employed hundreds and hundreds of people on the south coast, gone, obliterated. Fourteen stocks placed under moratorium. Some of them still are 20 years later. Others are just, just a piddly little fishery. Very few of them have bounced back to health. Now, if, uh, if, if the uh, privatization, i.e. putting in property rights, ITQs, uh, is the key to good stewardship, then how do you explain that every single one of those 14 stocks was managed, at least in part, and in some cases entirely, with an ITQ program? I mean, the reality is that neither ITQs nor competitive fishery by and of itself is a, is a, is a uh, you know, it guarantees or, or necessarily brings with it stewardship. There, there's really, that's almost a separate question. But I look at, on the other hand, if you look at a fishery in the eastern seaboard of North America, right up to and including our province, uh, where there isn't even quotas, let alone transferable quotas and, and, and all the trappings that go with that. It's lobster fishery. And that fishery with just input controls, like pot limits and stuff like that, has actually grown almost exponentially uh, in, 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 uh, you know, over a period of time. It has its ups and downs. It doesn't steadily go up, it goes up and it goes down. But it's been a steady performer for a long, long period of time. Small level here because because we're on the northern extremity where it survives. So, so you know, I think what we have to do, we got a big challenge going forward. Probably the biggest one is how we manage the intergenerational transfer. Uh, we've got a bunch of baby boomers. A few of our colleagues are here tonight, <laughs> see, uh, who are, you know, getting near the end of their working life. Many of whom we are, are desirous of moving on. Some have a, somebody else in the family to pass the enterprise on to a lot don't because the, the kids have moved on to something else. So how we go from, the, from there, from where we are now to where we're going to be in the future, uh, is, there's going to be a criti some critical public policy decisions uh, in, in how that works. We had a remarkably successful uh, lobster sector uh, rationalization program. It was not driven by a goal of having fewer people in the fishery. That wasn't the goal at all. The goal was, we had a goal, our organization had a goal which was to improve the, we, there was clear research done that demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that the incomes in that sector were unacceptably low and weren't a decent living and you weren't going to attract young people. So the goal was how do we, it was to try and get those incomes at a more acceptable level so we would attract young people. And the means towards that end, or a mean, well certainly a key uh, means towards that end, was to get the number of licenses more in balance with the, with, the, with the resource so that those who were at it could make a good living. All voluntary, it had a tremendous, tremendously successful outcome relative to the level of public investment in that program. We need to build on that in other sectors. We need, as our shrimp and crab go down, as they almost certainly will, the evidence on that is, is unfortunately very, very clear, or, or shaping up very clearly, uh, then we have to say we have to have a plan so that in the future, the, the single, the, you know, I heard the minister talk about the, the provincial minister talk about the, the um, fund that was negotiated with the federal government, uh, fisheries, whatever it's called, fund, and I applaud the uh, then premier for seizing the opportunity and getting that. But he talked about the pillars on which that would be the, you know, that would guide how that's used. I can't imagine a pillar that's more fundamental to a successful uh, transition from where we are now to the, you know, kind of the next generation uh, than doing everything that can reasonably be done to ensure that the fishing enterprises that are the absolute guts of those little communities that Barb showed on the map and that I've been talking about, uh, that the enterprises in those communities have a stable financial foundation which gives the owner operator a reasonable chance of having a, uh, of running a prosperous enterprise for a long time in the future and continuing to generate the kind of wealth that keeps those little communities ticking over in spite of insurmountable odds uh, uh, to the contrary. So those are just a, a kind of a few slightly rambling thoughts uh, for a fellow who lost his notes um, on just a few of the points that are contained. But I think just the idea that we, that Memorial University and this Great to be back in the Thompson Center again, which <laughs> what, I, what I think of this place as. Um, the, uh, and I was here for the opening. <laughs>
getting wrong in the tooth, but it, to, what a great to see that, like I think it's a useful, very useful contribution to our province that someone that takes the time and the effort to write comprehensively to shun kind of the conventional wisdoms that, uh, that would uh, get on your nerves and say, let's, let's put the thinking cap on and think about what is it that makes the fishery an important part of our co coastal communities and how can we do things better to make sure it continues to do so in the future. So for you and your colleagues, thanks for that. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have my notes on an iPad. And it occurred to me when you talked about losing your notes that my battery might die. <laughs> Should be the modern day equivalent, I guess. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mike and Rob Greenwood and the team at the Harris Center for asking me to be here tonight. Uh, I spent most of this week talking to the media and, and generally angry people uh, about appointing youth to elect, uh, democratically elected councils. Uh, it's nice to spend an evening talking about something that is far less controversial uh, in our <laughs> province, the fisheries and regionalizing municipal government. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Barb and her team for doing just an outstanding job uh, on a piece of research that, I mean, I know nothing about the fishery, but I know when I see that somebody understands what we need in regional government and governance in this province, and it's in that paper, and I'm really happy to see that. Um, I want to talk about, sort of riff off of three things that Barb and her team talked about in her paper. Uh, that being planning, integration, and she doesn't really call it this, but I call it power. Uh, but first, for those of you who don't who, who need it, a little, a short little history of municipal government in this province. Um, we have 276 independent municipalities in the province. There's actually over 600 places, communities in the province, but only 276 are incorporated municipalities with councils that can tax and pass bylaws. The majority of them were created in a very tightly packed time period between the mid to late 60s and the early 70s. And they did not grow out of some yearning for self-determination. Most of them were created so that you could e more easily flow money from St. John's into a community to pave roads or put in water and that sort of thing. About 50% five, of them have a population under 500. 75% of them have a population under 1,000. They spend $450 million a year on various municipal services. They spend 70 to $80 million a year just building infrastructure. And right now as we speak, there's about $2.5 billion worth of municipal infrastructure in the ground, on the ground in this province. Half of it is at the end of its useful life. So we need to replace one and a quarter billion dollars worth of municipal infrastructure, the roads we drive on, the pipes that deliver water to our houses, and we're spending about 80 million bucks a year. To manage all of that in these 276 communities, 52% of them have two or fewer staff, as Barb referred to the town clerk in St. Paul's, who is probably part-time, probably does most of her work out of her living room uh, with little or no support. That is an extremely common scenario in our province. What that means is that we've got a very weak, fragmented system of local government with very little technical support to the, to the elected officials, officials who ultimately have to make decisions about how we're going to replace that $2.5 billion worth of municipal infrastructure. And it means we have a very weak planning system to understand how to do that in the best way. So the first point is that I want to go to is planning. It's, it's a, it could be a very strong role for municipalities. It's, it's envisioned in the paper as one of the strongest roles for municipalities in pulling people together. But it's a potential role only. It's a latent capacity. We don't have, I, I tell people, we don't have a planning culture in the municipal sector in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, I might say we don't have a planning culture, period, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Because of how our communities started, they didn't start to plan for the future. They started to flow money. Much has changed. They're responsible for way more than they used to be. But there's artifacts 
of that time period. There's people on council now who started back when their council was created. They're still there 30 years later. Uh, there is a, a belief, an underlying belief, I think, in a lot of, with a lot of councillors, that planning equals inactivity. They were elected to do something, not to sit in a room and think about what they might do. And there's a wall there between them and effective planning. Regional government, I think, uh, can be a foundation for improving, improving how we do planning, for effective planning in the province. It's the right geographic scale. We have tiny, tiny separated communities all over the province. It's very difficult to do planning uh, when you have that kind of geographic layout. Regional government would have the resources to do it right, financial resources, technical resources, HR resources. Uh, it would capture the spillover things, environmental, economic, that go beyond the boundaries of municipal government, fisheries included, coastal management included. And they would have the ability to integrate municipal planning with all the other kinds of planning that are happening or maybe not happening, again, that, that's highlighted in the paper. Uh, coastal zone management, economic development, environmental management, watershed management. All of these things are connected, but they don't touch one another. They don't talk to one another. And if we had an integrated system of regional government, they would, assuming we put all those things under regional government, and that's what we're proposing. They can't be addressed. All of these things can't be addressed in isolation. Municipalities are responsible for wastewater treatment, sewers. We have 600 untreated sewer outfalls dotting the coastline of our province. We have aquaculture, we have small-scale fisheries, we have tourism, we have all sorts of things that can be affected by this. But there's no integrated approach to solving that problem. And nobody who's trying to fix the wastewater problem is talking to the tourism people or the fisheries people. We need to fix that. I think we need regional bodies, regional governments to fix that, to pull all those things together. But they've got to have the power to act. Regional government has to be able to hire stronger and more technical staff than exist in the municipal sector right now. They've got to give the elected officials who make decisions better advice, provide better capacity. And I think regional government will represent a stronger political voice. One of the arguments against regional government in my world is we'll lose our voice. Our community will lose our voice, will be diluted in the, in the region. And to some degree, that may be true. My question back to them is, with this voice you have, how often do you win? When you're up against the provincial government or the federal government or a big company, how often does your voice win for you? Never. It almost never wins. We need stronger voices for these communities, and they won't come, and they can't be supported from individual small communities. I think stronger regional government will shift the political center of gravity of the province, and I think that's a very good thing. I think the closer decisions are made to the people that are affected by those decisions, the better chance those decisions have of staying, of standing, and standing the test of time. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about adjacency principles all the time in reference to access to resources. I think it should apply to governance as well. If a decision affects you, you should have authority over it, as close to you, where you live as possible. Uh, there's a, in political science, there's a terminology in, Rob Greenwood turned me on to this quite a while ago, called subsidiarity, where you assign the authority to do something about things at the lowest level of government possible. And you keep doing that until it just doesn't make any sense anymore. And then you move to the next one. Well, in our system, we did it upside down. The federal government has way too much power. The provincial government has more power than it needs and is responsible for more things than it needs to be. And the local if we had regional, regional governments really don't have much at all in terms of resources or authority. But they're the ones who make decisions that most immediately impact people's lives, 
and how well uh, a business or fishing enterprise can undertake their work. I think regional government could significantly expand the influence that residents have on extremely important issues like fisheries management uh, and move those things in a direction that is more in line with what they want. So what should regional government be? Um, lots of folks, when we talk about regional government, will point to Nova Scotia. We don't like the Nova Scotia model in particular. Uh, Nova Scotia has a model where um, municipalities, um, counties exist to take care of everybody in, within their boundaries. Um, it's a single sort of tier system. We don't like that system. We like individual communities to continue to exist and have representation on sort of like a joint council that could take on all kinds of planning work um, and provide land use planning, water and wastewater services, fire and emergency services, whatever services the municipalities in that region wanted to take on, it could take on and they'd be funded by the municipality. What we're talking about is capturing the democratic legitimacy of local government and giving it a stronger regional life. Uh, allowing residents to use a much stronger tool to affect change in their communities. There's no reason why once created a properly resourced regional government couldn't play a significant role, and I mean a really significant role, in fisheries policy and management. In fact, I think it could do that and a lot more. As Barb mentioned, in terms of demographics, we're running out of time. In my world, in the municipal world, average age of councillors is in the mid-50s and getting higher. We have maybe 15 to 20 years to completely and utterly change our system of local democracy, to start over again and make it work. Bad decisions about our lives are being made too far away, and that's only going to change if we change the tools we use to make those decisions. Regional government is one tool we can use for that change, and I think we need to wield it before it's too late, and I really thank Barb and her team for raising that as a, a strong tool in your paper. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Craig and Earl and Barb. Uh, I'm Rob Greenwood, uh, Executive Director of the Harris Centre, and delighted to see a, a very healthy crowd here on, as Mike mentioned, a first warm night of, uh, we won't call it summer yet, but late spring. Uh, we have two wireless mics in the room, and I will keep track of hands going up in the room and try to get to you in order. Uh, for those of you watching online, send an email or a tweet at the addresses that appear at the bottom of your screen, and we will read them out in turn with the hands that go up. Morgan will keep track, and I'll keep track of him. Uh, keep your questions or comments short, and uh, try to bring it to a question. It's in the dialogue that we really learn things. And uh, we have some uh, time cards we used on the speakers. I'll use them on you if I have to. Uh, but uh, this is really where the, the fun begins. You can direct a question to a particular speaker, but I'll let the other panelists uh, have a crack at it if they want, but they don't have to be, feel obliged to answer every question. So, who'd like to go first? And I will keep track as we go. Get one over here. And please do introduce yourself as you take the mic. Hi, I'm uh, Charmaine Allen. I'm a student here at Monty's uh, doing research in fisheries. Um, it doesn't matter who answers this question, but I, I, I do have to ask it. Uh, recently, I went to the Costa Bays region, and we were talking about the fisheries and what the future of the fishery in that area might be. And um, one thing that was glaringly obvious was that whether you do it through buyouts, whether you do it through reverse auctions, whether you do it through ITQs, you're decreasing the number of fish harvesters in communities. Whether we say we have commodified or we have uh, fishing rights in Newfoundland, you can pick up the navigator at any time, for sale, enterprise, boat, license, quota. The thing that, I, that troubles me, uh, and I think another thing that needs to be d done, um, is when I was at DFO, I was there for many years, I never once saw a social economic assessment done 
on the impact of removing fish harvesters and fishing enterprises out of communities, whether that's permanently removing them or whether that's allowing them to be transferred out of communities and into another region. And I would like for someone to help me reconcile uh, the fact that we don't do the impact studies on communities when, when we put these processes in place. Great. Thank you, Charmaine. Who would like to go first on that one? Earl. Uh, yeah, I guess there's, um, there's a lot of policies that have been in, uh, enacted and then modified and so on without, unfortunately, without that kind of, a, uh, of analysis that Charmaine talked about. A good recent example. Uh, there was, a, and I, I guess just I'll, I'll digress slightly. Back when I, when I started in the union in the late 70s, we had a campaign. It used the terminology of the time, actually, which you'd, you'd word it a little differently these days because we have more women involved in the fishery. But the slogan we in, uh, adopted was license the man, not the vote. And what that really meant was the, the individual would have a license, which then you wouldn't, then it wouldn't be transferable. You wouldn't go to, if you, if, if you had a license, give your right to fish and you fished. And if you stop, well, okay, your license was, you know, if some, you, you wouldn't then transfer that, pass debt on to somebody else, and have a gradual, a gradually increasing uh, uh, debt load associated with any particular fishing license. So in any event, we lost that one. That was a fundamental policy decision. Uh, that was really implemented, not quite, maybe stealth would be strong, but it certainly wasn't done in any, with any great transparency. Uh, the, but an example, in, in terms of the kind of analysis, uh, DFO implemented two, uh, a combining policy in 2007, enterprise combining. So one license holder could buy out another and double their quota holding, as a, you know, the fishing rights. Without one shred of analysis, not to mention uh, without a shred of consultation, uh, came completely out of the blue to our organization. You know, we're pretty involved in, some, in a lot of these issues. Uh, federal government last year announced, oh, we've changed that, and now it's three for one. You can now combine. No one said, well, how, what was the, uh, uh, the sort of performance of the policy of combining two for one? What did that do? What was the, like, the economic vi you know, viability and stability of the enterprises that went through that as opposed to the ones who didn't? Did that make them better off or worse off? None of that took place, and they said, oh, well, we'll make it three for one. Uh, and uh, so it is, uh, it is frustrating. In terms of the numbers of people in communities, ultimately that's, that's driven by economics. How many, how many uh, uh, enterprises can the value that comes out of the ocean support? Uh, uh, and uh, we've got a major uh, problem coming at us in the, in the shift from shellfish to to, uh, to uh, ground fish for the simple reason that we just look at, I mean, the fact of the matter is the snow crab fishery has paid a lot of bills in this province for a long period of time. That's really carried the freight. Uh, shrimp for a lesser period of time in, 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 in fewer, with fewer enterprises and communities, but the two of them combined is really what's been dri driven. And we have a huge challenge, one, not least of which, not least of which is to get a rec trying to get a recognition that in fact, the ground fish stocks are rebounding. And the idea that somehow you absolutely uh, minimize almost to zero any ground fish opportunity, fishing opportunities, even as the shellfish stocks are going down, you, you tell people, and in fact, in some cases, lecture to them, well, you've got to understand that the resource is going down, the scientific advice is, is, is more negative, therefore, we've got to curtail uh, fishing. Yet, when there's clear scientific advice saying there is room for more fishing, uh, that, the, the, you know, not to act on that. So there's got to be some kind of balance there. But that is, it is a challenge. We are going to have, in terms of, have to, to have enterprises that there's any kind of a living in that any young people are going to want to go into. Uh, the fishery that seems to me we'll have on our, at our disposal for the next couple of decades, at any rate, will support fewer enterprises than the one that we've, uh, we've spent the last, uh, however many decades you want to go back, uh, uh, we, we, we've enjoyed. It's going, to be, it's going to be challenging. Thanks. Earl, Barb, want to jump in on that? Um, 
Yeah, and I think from from our point of view, I mean, to to some degree, I had to build on the research that we've done, right, Charmaine? And I think some of the work that you're going to be doing in Costa Bay's is work that needs to be done, and it hasn't really been done. Looking, kind of looking pretty deeply at the regional level at what's happening inside of fisheries in terms of licensing and so on. But at the, the point of the paper is to say, you know, when we think of value opportunities in fisheries, you know, I think we have to look at, you know, what is the range of opportunities and are there opportunities that are being missed? I think another point in the paper is that we are, we're operating fisheries independently of other sectors. Um, and, and I think in some places there are opportunities for certain kinds of hybrid enterprises. Now, I, I know there's a strong history of kind of anxiety about that, right? So school teachers are taking over fisheries and so on and so forth, right? But again, how can we get some of these hybrid enterprises um, and they may be co-ops, uh, uh, or they might be different kinds of mechanisms where we can add value uh, to what's coming out of the fishery and then, again, try to find a way uh, to, you know, to, to maximize uh, the, the assets that are there and anchor them in those, in those particular regions. So, I mean, I, I share your concern about some of the things that you're describing. I mean, when we were doing research on the West Coast, um, we were looking at the impact of the moratorium in places like, say, the, the Bond Bay area. And there had been a substantial decline in the number of fishermen. They were down to 14, and then they went down during the Cura, right? So, you know, that's a fairly substantial fishery in that area. There's a very good seafood retail market. There is a fish plant. You know, what, how many harvesters could that region support? And again, our concern was that, well, maybe we'd end up with no harvesters in that region. And then when we looked at community food security data, people were saying, well, where, when we asked them, where do you get your seafood? And they get it from people in the industry, right? So they get it from fishermen. So if you get your seafood from fishermen and there are no more fishermen in that region, then where are people going to get their seafood? Uh, you know, and, and do they, you know, do they have to go someplace else? And, and is that going to affect local consumption? And is that going to affect your opportunity to use the fishery as a basis for economic diversification in those regions? So these are the the point that I'm making is that we there are questions that we think need to be asked. Um, and I think you know, the, I mean, the union right now is I think doing really interesting stuff with the halibut fishery. Um, you know, that showing that you can generate quite a lot more value from that fishery by managing it in a different way. Uh, and the halibut fishery, I think, can be a key part of, of enterprises and a much better part of enterprises than it was when it was managed. You know, it was a 24-hour or 10-hour or whatever uh, fishery that, got, that dumped very high-value seafood onto the market in a very short period of time. So it's looking at the options and then doing the monitoring, you know, and again, my point would be, you know, fisheries have to be looked at at the regional level and we need a regional voice. And I think you have it within the organization of fisheries within the union. You have fishermen's committees, you have a series of, of, of organizational structures there, but they're not bridging into some, uh, some other structures. Uh, and, and I think more of that could be happening. Thanks, Barb. Craig, uh, I'm doubting you're chomping at the bit to jump on on this one, but well, on the on the point of uh, socioeconomic assessments, I, I think one of the fundamental issues there is that the voice from the region that would that should demand that is too fragmented, too weak, can't organize itself to do it, um, and we need, as Barb just mentioned, we need that integrated regional voice not just a voice, you need resources, you need policy analysis, you need research in the region that would either force that assessment to happen or just do it and then force somebody to respond to it. Uh, but the fact is when all the power lays elsewhere or most of the power lays elsewhere, that sort of thing is not going to happen. Thank you. So we have a question emailed in and then we have one up here in the middle. Uh, Rosemary Omer uh, sent a question for Craig and Earl. Um, 
are there ways in which the FFAW and municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, could and would wish to get together on regional planning and restructuring, or are there obstacles to, to this of which we are not aware? Thank you, Morgan and Rosemary. And who'd like to go first on this one? You go ahead. Okay, go ahead, well, Earl. Uh, you go ahead, and I'll tell you your answer. Actually, <laughs> uh, the, um, well, actually, I, I, there, I think there are issues on which we, we can, and from time to time have, not as much as, as we should have, I believe. Uh, but, uh, for example, before they, when I arrived tonight, I said, Craig, have you guys got any, uh, you, the, the municipalities, Newfoundland, Labrador, got any forums coming up at which we can uh, have someone come in and talk about and provide some, you know, kind of detail and background of this, of the changes that are taking place in the industry and what they mean for communities. Uh, the shrimp one being an example, the, the regime shift in the ocean and the consequences of what all that means for our communities. And I think that it is, I think there is value in our two organizations uh, doing that, uh, at least on an issue by issue basis, if not, yep. if not more systematically. I think the, the only real barrier, uh, number one, yes, there's lots of opportunities. Uh, and there's, there are venues, there's research we can do, there's events we can do together. Um, there's advocacy work we can do together. The challenge, uh, getting back to the point of integration, is that organizations like ours have our own silos. You know, we have demands on us to get certain things done for our members. And uh, delving into the fisheries for a municipal organization is a very interesting prospect. And I'm sure delving into the municipal politics world for a union or a fisheries organization is an interesting prospect. So the only real barrier is uh, just treading carefully and making sure we, we uh, we do it properly. But there's certainly, I mean, you've only got to read the paper to understand that, yeah, there's massive opportunities for, both, for our organizations to work together. And we have in the past, and I'm sure we will in the future. It just, as Earl said, it's been on a, an ad hoc basis, piece by piece. Barb, want to jump in on this one? Well, just the, there, there was something that didn't get into the policy paper because I ran out of time. <laughs> Um, the, there's Norwegian research, which is really quite interesting, that's looking at the, you know, the um, sectors of the seafood processing industry in particular that uh, have survived, you know, that survived the, uh, the, the, the <coughs> fisheries crisis they had there in the early 1990s. And one of the interesting things about the research, I mean, first of all, just reading it, there are 500 seafood processing operations in Norway, 500, there's a lot. Um, you know, they have a Raw Fish Act there that, that basically, you know, was a mechanism for limiting vertical integration. Um, but, you know, there are lots of different operations. They're doing lots of different things. But one of the points that the authors of this research make is that, you know, if you want to understand how, you know, which parts of the processing sector are doing well, you can't just look at the companies, and where there are some really interesting companies doing interesting things. You also need to look at the community. Uh, and they, you know, in some of their communities, they might have 10 different processors operating. Uh, you know, they, their population isn't huge in Norway, right? I mean, it is a big fishery. But so, so I keep thinking, you know, we have, we're down to, in many cases, one plant per region. So, so where's, where's, and if that plant is only doing shrimp or it's only doing, you know, one or two species, then where, where are the opportunities at the community level across the sector, uh, you know, for, 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 you know, kind of value added coming in from the community context? So, and, and so that, that's part of what's, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. You know, do we really need fewer processors? I, you know, I know, I'm pretty sure we're down to one in the entire Port of Basque region. That's not good for those fishermen because they mean, it means they've got one buyer, basically. Um, and it's, I don't think it's good for the region. The two processors who were there were really quite different processors. They had different values. They had a whole different orientation. You know, so, uh, you know, I, 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 th I think we really do need to look at Again, kind of look closely at this, and, and again, we, we've been focusing on, well, we, we've got excess capacity. But capacity is a, is a complicated thing, right? And part of your capacity is community, it's social networks, it's sharing opportunities, it's looking, again, for ways different groups could work together, um, you know, to do more with 
with what they have or to do something new that they haven't done before. So, so again, I, I just, I, you know, I, th I, I think we need to look at this Norwegian research, but we also th need to think creatively, you know, would, would we be better off, again, with two or three different kinds of enterprises in a region uh, doing different kinds of things uh, than, particularly when you've got diverse fish landings. Because otherwise, most of what you're landing is getting trucked out. It's going someplace else. And maybe it doesn't all need to do that. Thanks, Barb. The gentleman here in the middle, you can introduce yourself, and then we'll go up to the one after. Uh, David Decker with the Fish Food and Allergy Workers Un Union. Um, yeah, just on uh, Barb's point, I guess, yeah. Um, too much capacity for what model, right? And uh, all according, I guess, what model you look at uh, for what, you know, where you got too, capacity. I, too much capacity. I think in this province, I think one of the things that have happened to us is with this whole wealth from oil, which we all know is temporary. I think, you know, if we're not careful through that, could be, uh, um, you know, or could be, uh, the reality is could be our downfall. Because the oil will, in terms of, eventually, in terms of disappear, we'll have to eventually be left in terms of with what brought us here in the first place, which is the wealth from the sea. And we don't, in terms of, use the wealth from oil to you know, uh, look at and reinvent our fisheries, reinvest in our communities, build these uh, resilient communities that depend on the fish. And I use an example, I guess, is uh, Iceland, right? Before 2008, I think you really look at Iceland, I think Iceland was just really losing its way. And if you listen to them, we get, uh, you know, yearly contact with the fishermen's organizations in Iceland where we meet once a year. And all the talk before 2008 was really the financial uh, empire in Iceland was taken over. They were really the financial wizards and all kinds of, in terms of financial deals they were putting together. And driving the economy was the financial uh, empire, right? And fish had sort of got lost in the shuffle. And after the collapse, they were left with fish. Mm -hmm. That was it. And since that time, if you look at it in terms of what they've done, because they, as a society, were forced to look at it, it was what they had, and they were either going to make it or break it on fish. They've done a tremendous job of, uh, of increasing the value of that fishery. Tremendous job. They're basically utilizing, I think, up to 97% of even like a codfish now, to utilize 97% of it. You know, they're uh, developing value everywhere. They're putting in, within 36 hours, putting this fish in, into the U.S., fresh fish into the U.S., creating tremendous value out of it. And right now, uh, for instance, uh, just, uh, just a few months ago, uh, uh, had uh, people from New Zealand go into Iceland and look at how they're doing their fishery because where's New Zealand? New Zealand, and, and I quote from an article, I'm mean, totally dependent on leased foreign vessels uh, and cheap foreign labor. That's their fishery which basically in terms of being very little into the economy, right? In terms of look at Iceland in terms of what they've done is just remarkable. And the last point I say here is that um, the fishery has become the glamour industry in Iceland, right? This is an article from Iceland today. There is a waiting list to get into the boats to become fishermen. It is such a high paid job that you don't, we don't need foreigners to do it. Just remarkable what they are because they were forced to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's time for us, I think, to start, and this is why this conversation is good, it's time to start taking in terms of the money that we have now, now which is basically one time thing, start reinvesting it and start reinventing that and so that we got an industry that we can pass on to future generations. Great, thanks a million. Any response or comment on that? Uh, well, I guess the, uh, I just to touch on New Zealand because I think it's, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's what happens when you let ideology run amok. Uh, in New Zealand, they, they really had a radical deregulation of the entire mm -hmm. economy back, I guess it was probably started in the 80s or quite some time ago anyway, not just in the fishery, but everything. Deregulate everything. Uh, and uh, in the case of the fishery, what it gave rise to in fairly short order from a fishery was, yeah, it was kind of like ours, it wasn't as big as ours, or, but you know, they had community-based fisheries of a sort there. Uh, they went to a largely the, uh, to a, a place where most of the offshore fish, in, and they, they didn't have the complication we got of their economic zone going beyond 200 miles. Their 200 mile limit took in their entire fishing grounds. Uh, most of their offshore, something like two thirds of their offshore fishing effort was done with foreign trawlers, uh, 
Korean or Chinese generally, which employed third world labor, usually from Indonesia or the Philippines or somewhere like that, uh, landed the product in China for processing and, exp and export to Europe or North America. Now, you, you, you're hard pressed to find the New Zealand benefit in that. Like, where's the New Zealand, other than for an individual who has the right to, to peddle the fish to the, the Chinese captain or Korean captain, what other benefit? In fact, for the people, one of the things they found is that they lost the link between the fish and the community, and local people could no longer get the types of fish that they grew up on because it was all being caught in sh and, and wasn't even touched in shore in New Zealand. That's where it inevitably takes to the point where it became a matter of national shame to the country that they had a scandal of sl slavery on board the vessels. And they, to the point of a, that they appointed a commission, a national commission of inquiry into slavery on vessels fishing in New Zealand waters under New Zealand quotas. That's how bad it got. So that is where, you know, like kind of where deregulation eventually takes you. If you don't have any real basis in principle of what you want to do with your resource and how that relates to your communities and your people and their survival and their prosperity in the future, then that's that's kind of where you end up. Yeah. And, uh Earl's talking about Christina Stringer's work, uh, and her work is cited in, in the background policy paper that we wrote. And so, and so she broke the, the slavery story, but she's also, I mean, again, I had an interesting uh, Skype conversation with Christina when I was working on this. I mean, she was basically you know, asked to try to find a way to increase the value from the New Zealand fishery that was going back into the New Zealand economy. And so she started to take a, a, a deeper look at that. And so there's some other work that she's doing that's also important that's cited in the paper. And really what she's finding is a lot of the processing is, is no, and almost all of the processing is happening outside of New Zealand. Uh, and she, you know, she suggests towards the end really that, you know, that even where there are opportunities for innovations, the companies are so heavily invested basically in that work happening somewhere else that they're gonna, they'll, they'll put that innovation in China or someplace else. It won't actually happen in New Zealand. So, I mean, that, 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 that's part of the whole discussion of the, the, the limitations of ITQs. And, and on oil, I'll just make an observation. We're spending our oil revenues on health care. We have an epidemic of obesity and diabetes, and those are both diet-related. And we have you know, a major seafood resource. 270 million kilos of seafood came out of our waters in 2012. What is our per capita seafood consumption? I have a pretty good, I, bet, you know, I don't think nobody's done it. Go and do that research. That's what we told the provincial government to do. Go and do that research. Triple it. Increase it five times that would be a good way to spend oil revenue money. Craig, on this one? Yeah, just very briefly, I'm struck by Dave's story about uh, people wanting to get into the fishery because uh, I think there's, there's value, and I'm sure it's happening somewhere, but there's gotta be value in, in following that story because when I was in Iceland a couple years prior to their collapse, and what I was told at the time, I, my host was bemoaning the fact that in the fishery, and if you know any Icelanders, they're very direct, uh, we can only get stupid people in the fishery now, and it's ruining the fishery. And um, if that kind of turnaround has happened, that's worth looking into. Iceland has an extraordinarily strong system of local government. Icelandic local governments collect income tax, and what they don't need, they send to the national government. There is strength at the local level. And uh, I'd love to take a look at how that weaves into how quickly they've recovered from this. Okay, we have two questions lined up. We need to finish right at 9.30 because we're webcasting and Rogers will rebroadcast. So put up your hand if you want me to get you, because what I'm gonna do, panel, you need to pay attention. Craig, if you need an old-fashioned piece, piece of paper, I can give you one. Uh, and I'll let Craig go first, then Earl, then Barb, and so you'll answer the next couple of questions and include your closing comment. And that's a good way of ending on time. Just watch. <laughs> Gentlemen up the top, introduce yourself, please. John Michael Lennon, uh, Barb, uh, wondering what sort of 
numbers, if there are any, on uh, if they decide to go the route they're going and the liability incurred with the closure of rural Newfoundland versus the amount of money we need to invest. It's a two-part question, Barb. And the other part is uh, how much knowledge, you know, is from what the potential opportunities are, are getting to the school kids and therefore back, back to the dinner table at night. Earl, am I ever going to be able to buy fish off a of fisherman in Kitty Vitty? Craig, have you guys looked at generating revenue through small-based utility companies for your regions like they do in the States so successfully? Thank you. Thank you. So remember those questions panel, and uh, we're going to go here, and then we have another one here. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Fred Windsor, and uh, I'm the um, uh, conservation chair with Sierra Club Canada in uh, the Atlantic region. <coughs> um, a couple of things that, uh, just a couple of observations uh, more than anything else, I think. Um, one is uh, nobody really had any mention of the, uh, the role of the, uh, the, minister, the federal minister of fisheries. Mm -hmm in the decision-making process. And I think that's, uh, that is crucial. Um, once you get past the high water mark, everything is, is under federal jurisdiction. And, and if you're talking fisheries, you have to go through the federal minister. The federal minister has incredible discretionary powers, is accountable basically to nobody. Mm. And when I say nobody, I mean nobody. Um, and can just do whatever they like. And I'm not talking about the person who's there. Mm. I'm talking about the, the, the position. Mm. And, and, and the, the minister does not have to accept any scientific information. They can disregard, doesn't matter what the scientific information is, the minister can completely disregard it and go ahead and do whatever they want. And we've had lots of examples of that over the years. And it's one reason why we're 22, we're 20, uh, uh, 20 years into uh, moratorium and not much sign of recovery and not and definitely no no strategy so uh, I just uh, I think those are uh, you know that and and in terms of getting young people into the fishery we have to do some major rethinking mm -hmm. and maybe go back to what we were originally a small boat fishery mm -hmm. near shore you might want to think about that thank you and Kathy, you have one other question lined up. So this will be the last question, then we'll go to the panel. Thank you. Uh, Everett Fancy, I'll, I'll save you a little bit of time, because I, I may not have a question, I just want to make a couple of comments, yeah. It, it's extremely nice to see uh, somebody talk about growing the, the fishery rather than shutting it down, right? And because you know, I, I just can't understand how so few people can't make a living off so much resource. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, well, I'll make an observation, too, that uh, uh, it, it seems like our, our, our uh, fishers, our, our, our communities, our harbors, and that, you know, uh, people are almost threatened, mm -hmm. feel threatened out there. Uh, and, and it's cutting down the activity. Uh, you, you need to, you know, uh, I listen to fisheries broadcast a lot, you know, I mean, and uh, you know, Paul John, rest the soul, you know, I've, I've listened to him a lot. But uh, people like David Boyd and, and these guys have talked about this for, for years, that they can't do anything. They're not allowed to do anything. Mm. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story that happened to me this summer. It, it, it's laughable. And it ties in with, with uh, what uh, Dr. Nice was talking about, needing to get people in boats and activity and that. I was in Clarenville, and I dropped into the uh, DFO office there on a, on a little errand. And I got talking to this lady who was there to pick up a license or some kind of thing. And we got talking about being in the boat and being in boats and that. And she said her daughter came in from the university that weekend and wanted to go out in the, uh, wanted to go out in the boat with her father. Her father was going to shoot some seals. And the fisheries officers came along and told him it wasn't allowed. Mm. They, they could have they charged her for being out there. A young woman in a boat from the university not allowed. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Thank you very much. So, Craig, you can go first, answer the questions you want, and this will be your last chance on any of it. Uh, first, gentlemen, I, I think you mentioned utilities. So you said as, like local utilities as a way to raise revenue. We have looked at it a little bit. Um, 
the, the way municipalities can raise money right now is extremely limited. Our, we have very prescriptive legislation. You can only do what it says you can. You can't do things that aren't listed in the, in the act. Uh, so we've done a little bit of research on that. I'd like to do more. I'd like to work with, I know we've done, we've talked to Andy Fisher and others at the university mm -hmm. about looking at small scale hydro and that sort of thing. We do have this issue about who's allowed to have a utility in this province. And that's a bit of an obstacle to get past. Uh, we are talking to the provincial government about what we call the fiscal framework, the way municipalities make money. It's, it doesn't work right now. 75% of their money comes from property tax. It's not a really good tax, uh, but they're sort of stuck with it. So we need to broaden out how municipalities make money and just generally free them up to do things. Like I said, right now we're sort of pinned in by legislation. Uh, role of the Minister of Fisheries. Uh, we run into that sort of thing all the time in terms of the high watermark and where a municipality is allowed to make decisions and where they can't. And if somebody has something built beyond the high water mark, can you tax them? Uh, not really interested in throwing our resources behind changing the Constitution, but I do believe that, if nothing else, more capacity, more power in the region would be a, a good first defense against somebody, as I said earlier, far away making bad decisions uh, about us and for us. Thanks, Craig. Earl, questions to address and final comments? Yeah, I guess what I'll try and do, because uh, uh, there's a lot of specific points, but really in, in, in kind of address them in, in, in kind of general terms. One of the problems, no question, the Fisheries Act confers an enormous amount of power on the minister. Uh, although there was a recent court case that overturned a decision that she, the current minister made on the basis that it was not in con conjunction with scientific advice, but that's, that's rare. Uh, the, I think what there's rethinking needed at all levels. I think that the scientists need to rethink some of the ideas and approaches that they have and have to be, I think we have in, in the ground fish, we've had, or I'm sorry, in the shellfish, we've had pretty, a pretty good, there's been a pretty good working relationship between uh, harvesters and scientists, a pretty good mutual respect. I'd like to see that expand in the ground fish because so far I haven't seen much evidence of that. Uh, I'll just say parenthetically that as the shrimp goes down, there are some armchair quarterbacks who say, look, they screwed up the management of the shrimp fishery. Well, if we have a policy, which we've had, that says that we've got to, uh, to absolutely minimize any harvest on ground fish stocks and allow the full recovery of those stocks, I'm not arguing against that, but I'm saying when you have that, there are implications on that. You, if you also say, but well, we want to keep the shrimp stocks at where they have been in this historically anomalous period of about 30 years, well then, w which one is it? Because you can't have both. And if you're saying we're going to allow this cod stock to recover, then you've got to accept there's not a matter of mismanagement that the shrimp will go down. The shrimp will inevitably go down because cod are a predator of, of shrimp. But quite apart from that, the, water, the environmental conditions are, no, are much less conducive now to shrimp reproduction. And even if there weren't any codfish there, it would probably still go down, uh, maybe not quite as fast. So I think there has to be a rethinking from a science point of view. I think some of the policies we have at the provincial level in terms of who can, you know, what, what are the licensing policies. I think our policies currently were designed, whether well, they were designed for an era when we had a whole lot of big factories, is what they were, employing hundreds of people in industrial type uh, operations that were the cornerstone of, some, of, of, of a, a number of communities that are basically gone. I mean, those big plants, there's hardly any, even the ones that are left are much smaller than what the, the, the bigger ones were a number of years ago. But we haven't really said, ad adapted our policy. So in a sense, our current policy in that regard kind of stifles innovation. If somebody says, I got an idea on a small scale of a little thing I could do that could take whatever species it might be, I'd take some aspect of it and really uh, run with that in, in terms of some small scale operation. Our current structure doesn't lend itself at all to that. So I think that that needs to be, uh, to be uh, rethought. One interesting, on, on young people, I think we should be, I don't know, I'm no expert on what's in the school curriculum, to say the least, and my memory is not good enough to remember what it was when I, when I was at it, but I think we need to, to be doing more in terms of having, helping kids understand the fishery. Interesting thing happened on our lobster bio. We had a voluntary lobster bio, 1,000 license holders. Uh, guess which ones had no interest in selling out whatsoever and, and held their licenses? The young ones. Mm -hmm. And actually having a, a reduction, we went in an area there was roughly 900 licenses or so, and 200 and, or 900 to 1,000, 270 or so ended up uh, uh, accepting a buyout. What that meant for the other enterprise, when we talk about growing the fishery, they 
that greatly enhances their prospect for survival in the fishery. So while there are some who left, they were mostly people who were getting close to retirement, mostly, uh, and their leaving opens the door for improved prospects for, the, uh, for, for those who remain. So to them, that was a revitalization and, and, and a growth opportunity. As to the regulations on why a young woman couldn't go in the boat with her father, I have no idea what thinking will be behind that, but I think what it is a function of, in all too many ways, people are setting regulations in our fishery, and this is probably true of other sectors of, of our economy as well, who have no real grasp or understanding of that which they are regulating. And that's not limited to federal. That can be at provincial and, and other levels as well. They just do not understand hmm. the nature of what there is that they're setting the rules for. And when you don't understand it, it's only by pure luck if you happen to hit a rule that makes a bit of sense. Thank you, Earl. Barb, response to questions and closing comments. Uh, John, I don't have numbers. Where are you? Is John oh, gone? Yep. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I mean, if there's a weakness in this uh, paper, it's, there's not a lot of numbers in it. Uh, I realized in some ways when we finished the Cura that the piece of work that hadn't been done that really needed to be done was some kind of um, documentation of uh, the economic contribution of uh, fisheries to communities. And I would also say the economic contribution mm. of community. Uh, so fisheries to communities, but also communities to fisheries, because I think we haven't done enough uh, to encourage people to be aware of, I who are in the industry, to be aware of the importance of their communities to them. So, but one of the recommendations is that this should be done on a routine basis. You know, that the government should be, you know, if we're, if we're trying to make a decision around fisheries management or trying to make an argument around fisheries management, uh, so and you can take the shrimp, the current uh, dispute in shrimp, it would be very, very nice to have the information at our fingertips that says, well, you know, this fishery provides generates this number of jobs, it puts this much wealth into this economy, you know, it provides this much support for the people in these other sectors, it does this, it does that. And my point is that I, if that data is there, I don't see it. And it, it, you know, it's not obviously available to me. What I see is production value, right? So landed value and production value. But there's no assessment of all of that value added. Now, my understanding is that, um, I've forgotten her name, the economist at Grand Paul, Charmaine. I always forget her name, sorry. Gabriella, uh, an it's economist at Grand Paul, is supposed to be doing that work now mm. uh, for some communities. But it should be done on a routine basis by the province so that information is, is available. Uh, there isn't much information about fisheries in school curriculum. We try to get more information into the school curriculum on fisheries, but it's very difficult to get anything into the curriculum because it has to fit their boxes, basically. They have very, again, the curriculum is written someplace else. It's written in St. John's. It's written, it's the curriculum is not based in that place and in the lives of those people. And I can, I'll never forget, you know, going to a school in port of port a high school, and we were working on eelgrass beds and doing, again, multidisciplinary research and going into the school and saying, saying, did you know that you have like a major eelgrass bed that's just down the street and you know, and the eelgrass is a major habitat and a nursery area. And they didn't, they knew nothing. They knew, and they had nothing in their curriculum on marine ecology, nothing, not to speak of fisheries. And I don't think that that's changed all that much. And it's, it's crazy. But it's, but it's very difficult to get space in the curriculum to bring fish harvesters in, to get it, this kind of information you know, with the, the people in the Sea Film Festival, um, you know, we run, sc we screen films in the schools, but it's difficult to get in. We had major negotiations to try and 